Hey guys, this is Steve from Featherlight, and today we're checking out Coda Music Technologies Stealth Inline Mic Booster. This thing has got some pretty impressive specs and we wanna find out if it lives up to the hype. Let's check it out. All right, so full disclosure, Coda Music Technologies sent us this particular unit for evaluation, but we have no ties to the company and they have no bearing or influence on our review whatsoever. As always, our reviews are unbiased and brutally honest about gear that works in a full-time working studio environment. So one of the first things you notice when you get this, honestly, is the packaging. It's packaged clearly and aimed at a premium market because this is really, really well put together. And that says a lot about the company that's building the product. Everything about it is well thought out. The device itself is actually beautiful. It's very well made, built like a tank, and that's important to me. It's important to a lot of studio owners because the build quality of something says a lot about other aspects of it as well, meaning it's design on the inside as well as it's design on the outside. If you're doing a podcast, especially an on-air podcast, this might be something that really interests you because it's clearly meant to fit into the aesthetic of your audio environment, especially something like an SM7B, for example, by Shure. This plugging directly into the mic itself really has a nice clean finished look. It's obviously meant to compete directly against things like the Fethead or the SE Dynamite or those kinds of inline mic boosters, but the design of this is substantially more impressive. So as far as the audio specs, let's get started and find out if they match up as well. We're gonna perform three completely different tests on the Coda Technology Stealth. The first is gonna be a test tone to measure the difference in the signal between the dry and the stealth. The second is gonna be whether it alters the frequency spectrum of the audio. And the third is gonna determine how much actual gain are we getting out of the device. All right, so we're gonna start inside the isolation booth here at Featherlight, and the reason why is we wanna eliminate as much of the outside factors as possible. We don't want any air conditioning sounds or heating sounds or outdoor noises or anything like that. And this isolation booth is really well insulated, so it keeps things down to a minimum. You'll never be able to get rid of every kind of noise, but we wanna get most of it out of the way for the test. The other thing is we need a definitive test. We need a test that's not open to interpretation. Meaning if I just tell you how it sounds or I make a recording of my voice, that's subjective. We wanna find out two things. We wanna find out if the mic with the stealth adds any significant noise and more importantly, does it change the physical characteristic of the signal path? Does it add something in the frequency response? So those two things we need a definitive test to determine. All right, so the first set of tests we're gonna do is generate two different kinds of test tones. The first one is gonna be a pure sine wave, and that's gonna go directly out of our calibrated studio speaker, directly into the SM7B and straight into our audio interface. We're gonna match the levels with that so that we have an even starting point that we can match exactly. The second test tone is gonna be a pink noise generator, and that's gonna tell us if there's any fundamental change in the signal type itself. Does it add any signal characteristics that weren't in the original signal to begin with? More low end, less high end, that kind of thing. So a pink noise generator will give us a starting point to know exactly what our SM7B sounds like all by itself straight into the DAW. When we run the second set of tests with the coda in line, we'll repeat those two sets of tests and we'll measure the difference. With our calibrated speaker and mic position locked in place, we raise the channel slider to unity, hit the solo button so we can get a true LED reading of the incoming signal. We raise the channel gain until we achieve zero dB. We'll check the main meters on the LED with more precision until we can achieve zero dB stably. Back into the computer's DAW, we arm the track and record our first 1K test tone through our calibrated studio speaker into the SM7B and from there directly into the head amp of our audio interface, bypassing the entire mixer's downstream architecture completely, bypassing any possibility for any additional effect to the signal that we're recording. Next up, with the exact same configuration, we'll switch to pink noise. Once we begin the test tone itself, we'll set our head amp to reflect the same zero dB incoming signal. Once we get that on our channel LED, we'll check it on our main LED for a bit more precision. Pink noise by definition is a constantly fluctuating analog signal, but we can get it in the ballpark 
which will suffice for the test that's going to determine if we have changes in the frequency spectrum. Just like before, back in our computer's DAW, we arm the track and then we initiate our pink noise generator and we record the dry pink noise straight out of the monitor into the SM7B and straight into our DAW. All right, so now it's time to add the code of stealth into the signal path and redo our tests. So we're gonna take our microphone and we're gonna add the mic booster in line and we're gonna do it directly after the microphone. When we first connected the Stealth to our older SM7B, we noticed the connection was a little loose for our taste. Your mileage may vary as the connector was just fine on some of our newer mics. So this may be dependent on the mic itself. This was an easy fix by simply removing it using a small spade screwdriver and inserting it in the expansion tongs and giving it just a little bit of a twist. This slightly increased the diameter of the connector and snugged the fitting up with no problem. And from that point forward, it worked great as well as on most of our other mics. We don't wanna be boosting any additional frequencies by a long length of cable between the microphone and the stealth. We wanna boost really just what's coming from the microphone. So Coda suggests that this plugs directly into the microphone itself. It can be used in other applications, but for our test here specifically, we're gonna go direct with this setup. All right, so once the Coda Stealth is in line, we can set our microphone up to the exact same position we had it before, and we go direct to the audio interface, just like before. The only additional step is we need to engage the fan and power on our audio interface, or in our case, the mixer itself, because the Coda Stealth gets its operational power from the fan and power on the board. Now with the Coda Stealth in line, we rerun the exact same test with our test tone. And the first thing we notice, of course, is the dramatically smaller amount of gain that's required to achieve the same zero dB test tone level. Back in our computer's DAW, we record the test tone result and then move on to the pink noise test. Next up is our pink noise test with the exact same circumstance and the same conditions. We go up to our head amp to adjust the gain and then we go over to our main LED to try to get as close to zero dB as we can. And then we finish off by recording straight into our computer's DAW for the final result. And after all the files have been recorded, it's time to do some measurements. We've tidied things up a bit and moved the files closer to each other. So the two test tones are on the top, the two pink noise files are on the bottom, and the top is the dry signal, and the one underneath it is the coda. And if we solo these and look at our meter over here, Let's give a little bit of playback sounds like this. You can see this guy is just under negative 25 dB. And if we look at the one where the stealth track is inserted, just over 25 dB. So that's to be expected since these were recorded in the analog world. And even though that they were test tone calibrated in the analog world, no two signals can be identical. However, in the digital world of our computer's DAW, the signals can be made to be exactly the same level. Any other kind of test would be completely subjective because once these are level matched and digitally the same exact level, we can make a meaningful determination between the difference. So to accomplish that, we're gonna use the normalization feature found in our computer's DAW. In this case, it's Cubase, and we're gonna go up to the effects suite and force normalize the dry signal to negative 15 dB. We're gonna do the exact same thing to the signal that has the code of stealth in it as well. And now these two wave shapes, even though they're different lengths, are exactly the same level. From here, we're gonna insert two instances of Steinberg's new Supervision Multi-Audio Meter Tool. This is an incredibly accurate measurement tool. Now, when we play these two back, you can see that these two tracks are playing back at exactly 15 dB. Not close, not in the ballpark, not our perception, but digitally accurate at minus 15 dB. That's important because there's no way to make a truly meaningful decision on the difference between the two waves unless both the test tones start out at exactly the same level. It's also important to note that we are deliberately metering off the wave shape itself and none of the downstream processing, including the EQs or fader positions of our DAW. And it's important to understand that the test tone itself is not the area that we're interested in. It's the part directly afterwards. That's known as the noise floor. And since these two wave shapes are exactly the same level for the test tone, we can measure the difference in the noise floor itself. So let's start some playback and make some meaningful measurements. 
And we do so, and you can see immediately that these two measurements are incredibly close to one another. So as you can see, our control track, which is the dry SM7B straight into the DAW, is at negative 80.78 dB, and the track with the Coda Stealth inserted is at negative 80.22 dB. Keep in mind that these are negative numbers, so what this means to us is there's approximately a half a dB difference between the two tracks. So as we can see, the Coda Technologies Stealth Mic Booster is only producing about a half a dB of self-generated noise for all of that stated 28 dB worth of gain. This is impressive audio performance, especially compared to its competitors, and that speaks directly to the quality of the components that are inside the Coda Technologies Stealth Mic Booster. With less than 1 dB of operational self-noise being added to our signal, that means that all of that stated gain in the specs is completely usable for whatever low output microphone you choose to use this on, especially things like a Shure SM7B that has notoriously low output and is fairly noisy to begin with. And now it's time to look at the pink noise test. This is gonna judge frequency response. It's gonna tell us if the Coda Stealth is adding or taking away anything in the frequency response of our test tone. So we're gonna do the same thing. We're gonna come to audio. We're going to come down to processes, choose normalize, and we're going to do the exact same thing. We're going to normalize it at minus 15 dB for the top one, and we're going to choose the bottom one and do the exact same thing. So now when these play back to back, they're going to be identical levels or as close as pink noise can be since the very nature of pink noise is a random pattern that includes high, mid, and low frequencies. So we're bouncing right around minus 20 here for that one. And we'll check the bottom one. And that's gonna be the same thing as well. So you can see the very nature of pink noise is bouncing all over the place, but the mean or average peak level of it is gonna be very similar. Unlike the test tones in the first test, this doesn't rely on those two signals being identical levels since we're going to be using them to compare the frequency difference between the dry and the signal that has the Coda Stealth inserted instead. Like before, we'll add an instance of Steinberg's Multimeter Tool Supervision on the track that just has the SM7B by itself, the dry track, and then we're going to do the same thing with the track directly underneath it, which has the Stealth inserted into the signal path. And we're also going to switch meter types altogether. We're going to be using spectrograms instead. This is going to look at the curve of the audio spectrum, and that's going to allow us to see if there's any difference between the dry track and the track that has the Stealth inserted into it. When we hit playback, we'll see a real-time readout of those two curves side by side. As we hover our cursor over the two graphs, we can get a real-time numeric note value of each one of the curve plot points. Now, we're going to enable our hold current values on stop because we want to see what these look like side by side after the meters are done measuring. All right, when we stop our meter, we get a real-time readout of the two side-by-side. -side. And as you can see, these are pretty close. There doesn't appear to be any real significant difference between the frequency response of the SM7B dry directly into the DAW or the SM7B with the Stealth inserted. So the claims of the Stealth being incredibly clean and its rated specs appear to be pretty accurate as it doesn't seem to affect the frequency response of the original wave in any way. And up next are our final gain tests. We wanna find out how much input it takes to achieve a zero dB reading on the meter. The first test will be our control, and that's the SM7B directly into the input of the Avalon. The output is set at plus five dB, and the input is cranked at 45 dB, which means it takes a total of 50 dB to achieve a zero dBU reading on our meter. Next up is the same test with the exact same conditions, and the only change is the addition of the Coda Stealth Mic Booster. With our output still set at 5 dB, the Coda Stealth Mic Booster requires only 15 dB of gain to achieve the same 0 dBU position on our VU meter. That's a fairly substantial gain increase considering its clean and clear gain and the Stealth easily achieves its rated specification of 28 dB of boost, shown here actually performing a little better than that. All right, so first things first, does this live up to the hype? Does it do what it says it can do? Well, yeah, it does. 
And that's pretty unusual nowadays in the audio world. So everything has pros and cons. Let's start with the cons first. It takes 48 volt phantom power. So if you're using a smaller mixing board or a smaller bus powered audio interface that doesn't provide phantom power, that might be an issue to you. It's more expensive than the least expensive tabletop devices in its price category. That might put it out of reach of a few. And the connector itself, that may be an issue for some, although ours, as we saw in the video, is pretty easily solved. So that may or may not be a con depending on your particular audio connections. The pluses, the pros, it has substantial gain for a very minimal operational noise penalty. In fact, it's almost a toss. At just a hair over a half a dB of noise, the amazing amount of gain this produces, 28 real dB of usable gain, that's pretty impressive. A lot of devices have that on paper, but by the time you use them and you get to the top of that range, you're introducing noise or artifacts. This does not. You have 100% of the available range for use and it is clean as can be. And that really speaks to the high quality components that are being used in here. So very clean and obviously very high quality components. It's an inline as opposed to a tabletop or floor design, which means it's always gonna be connected to the microphone, which means it's not gonna be amplifying any more noise than it absolutely has to. And that's just partly responsible for why it's so clean. The drawback of the tabletop and floor designs is that they're gonna be around other cables and cords and they're gonna amplify potentially that as well. So that's something to be concerned about. It's built like a tank, literally. It looks as good as it's made. That's unusual. There are some companies that really go the extra mile for design. This appears to be one of them. It is built solid. That's a big deal. If you're going to be chucking it in and out of boxes and bags and working in a real studio environment, it's build quality is a huge concern. This does not let you down. And lastly, it's beautiful. It's made as well on the outside as it is on the inside. And if you're doing things like on-air podcasts and that kind of stuff, that's gonna be an issue to you. You want that clean, high quality look to it, that aesthetic, this delivers in spades. So if you're looking for something that is absolutely a quality device and is about the same price point as its competitors, this should absolutely be on your short list. This comes highly recommended. Hey, if you learned something or if this was helpful in any way, please hit the subscription and notification bells. It really does help out the channel so we can keep going. Stay safe, be creative. We'll catch you guys in the next video.